Uh, I appreciate you guys having me to talk with you guys a little bit about writing. Um, and here I go struggling with technology again. All right, there we are. Um, so who am I and why listen to me? So my name's Brad Stahlberg and um, I'm a writer, which still feels kind of weird to say that I'm a professional writer and I'll get into that in a little bit of why that feels kind of, kind of bizarre to say. Uh, I've written two books. One is called Peak Performance. The other is called The Passion Paradox. You'll notice there are two names on both those books. So I'm super fortunate to work with a collaborative partner and co-author named Steve Magnus. So I wrote both books with him, which was really a blast. And then I also write essays and articles for Outside Magazine, which is a popular magazine here in the States. Um, the New York Times, which is a popular newspaper here in the States and, and elsewhere as well, and then some other pretty large publications. Um, all right, so before I get into actually trying to teach a bit on writing, I figured it would be worthwhile to give you guys some context on how I got to where I am today. Uh, so the first thing is, I was not a very good writer in elementary or middle school. Um, this was me trying to write when I was in fourth or fifth grade. Uh, I was told by English teachers that I would never be a good writer. Um, I was told that I should get extensive tutoring. I was told that my handwriting was bad. Back then, we used to write by hand, which kind of funny of it. That's how people were judging whether or not one could be a writer. Um, but yeah, I really struggled. I did not get good grades in writing classes, and um, it was challenging but I always enjoyed it, so I worked really hard at it. Um, so in high school, I thought that I was becoming a good writer. Uh, so this would have been my affect in high school. Um, I really liked it. I was in the advanced placement courses. Um, it was by far my favorite subject in school. I was getting pretty good feedback on the types of things that I was working on from both teachers as well as um, my peers. So I thought that I'd be a good writer. Um, all right, so. I applied to Northwestern School of Journalism, which is um, arguably the best writing school in the world. And they thought otherwise. They didn't think I was a great writer. So I didn't get in. Um, and I was a 17 year old at the time. And like most 17 year olds, I kind of shrugged my shoulders. I was a little bit upset. And I said, okay, guess writing's not for me. Um, I'll go do something different. So I ended up studying economics and psychology in college, um, which is obviously very different than writing. I'm sure you guys have had good lectures on some of these other topics as well. So in my mind, I thought, all right, well, I gave it a good shot. Uh, I guess I'm not going to be a writer. I'm going to learn about economics. I'm going to learn about psychology, and I'll get a job in one of those two fields working in industry. Um, so... After college, I went to a large consulting firm called McKinsey and & Company, and I also started running. So that's a picture of me looking like a tough guy on the screen. And it turns out that working at McKinsey and running became my journalism school. I had no idea at the time, but McKinsey & Company is one of these big consulting firms where you do all kinds of PowerPoint presentations. And it turns out, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later, that writing a good PowerPoint presentation in a McKinsey and Company project is very, very similar to writing a nonfiction book. So there's a thorny problem that you're trying to solve. You're not really sure where to start, so you have to talk to a bunch of experts, which is very similar to reporting. You have to look at all the research also to see what the scientists say. And then you generate a hypothesis of what you think that the company should do. And over time, you have to tell a story on that hypothesis. So this is what we think the company should do. Here's what the expert said. Here's why. And writing a nonfiction book is very, very similar. So when I was at McKinsey, little did I know, but I was kind of training myself to write nonfiction. Um, on those projects, I always gravitated to be the person that was doing the storytelling. So my format was PowerPoint. It wasn't writing books or articles, but I was still telling stories. And then around the same time I was at McKinsey and Company, I became really interested in endurance sports. And this was, um, 
this was probably so you guys are what 11 years old yeah so this was this nine. was maybe nine all right so this was before you guys were born so before you guys were born man you're making me feel old um blogs were becoming all the rage so shane was like on the cutting edge of this in farnham street but there was this huge movement that people had blogs and even if no one really read your blog it was a pretty cool thing to do to have a blog so I started a blog where I wrote about my experience running marathons and nobody read the blog, but me, not even my girlfriend at the time read the blog. Like no one gave a crap about my marathon running, but what it did is it gave me a regular space to write and I was consistent with writing. So what that did is it, it, it again, it kept me sharp. It kept me writing and I was just following my interests. So, Fast forward a little while, and I did take a job after working at McKinsey um, for a large healthcare system. And again, nowhere in my mind did I think I was going to be a writer. But I was working on a project that I thought was really valuable for the general public to hear about and for other healthcare systems to hear about. So having no idea of how any of this stuff worked, I pitched a couple big newspapers here in the States the story. So I wrote an essay, I sent it to the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Los Angeles Times. And lo and behold, I got an email back from an editor at the Los Angeles Times who told me that they loved the article and that they wanted to run it in the Sunday newspaper. And I remember she said, she said, who are you? And I said, uh, I'm Brad. And she said, well, we couldn't find any other published work. Who do you write for? And I said, uh, I have this blog on running that I would be embarrassed if you read. Um, I don't write for anyone. And that was my big break. So I had a huge lucky break um, that the Los Angeles Times wanted to run this story. But I say make luck happen because I also was actively pitching newspapers this essay that I wrote, not knowing how hard it is to get an essay placed. So they ran the story in the Sunday paper and it did really well. Lots of people read it. There was all kinds of discussion on it. Um, so then I just kept writing. And again, at no point in my mind am I thinking I want to be a writer. This was always just something that I enjoyed doing. So first I wrote for the Huffington Post, which is a blog that's not too prestigious. They didn't pay me anything. But I was just so thrilled that finally somebody other than myself was going to read my blog. So I started writing for the Huffington Post. Then I started writing for a magazine called Men's Fitness, which is not a very highbrow magazine. Um, but they were paying me $100 to write a column. So I'm sitting there thinking, this is the greatest thing ever. People are paying me to write. Well, it turns out that I wasn't writing the kinds of stories that Men's Fitness wanted. So I started to pitch magazines that covered more of the culture, like Outside Magazine. And after multiple rejections, they finally bit on a story. And I tried really hard and I wrote as well as I could. And that story did quite well. So I started writing for Outside Magazine. And then after that, for Wired. And then Sports Illustrated. And now the New York Times. Um, so a lot of people look at me and they say like, man, you're only 34 years old and you've got essays in the New York Times and two books. How'd you make it happen? And what they don't see is they don't see the blog that nobody read but my wife. They don't see the kind of crappy columns in men's fitness in all the steps that it took to get to a place where I'm fortunate enough to write for some pretty big, well-known publications. So at that point, I said, all right, I guess I'm going to be a writer. And um, it still, as I opened up this, this, this presentation, it still feels a little bit bizarre because it was this dream of mine that I had growing up and then I kind of wrote it off, but little did I know that I was always following my interest, which was to tell stories, even if it was in PowerPoint form or even if it was on a blog that no one read. Um, and I was just able to keep following my interest until I reached a point where I could actually get paid to do it and make a career doing it. Um, so I have a very untraditional path to writing. I was a poor English student in fourth and fifth grade. I never went to journalism school. I got rejected from journalism school, um, but I just kept on writing. So that's, that's my background in, in how I got to where I am today. Um, 
So now, if it's okay with you guys, I want to shift into a couple principles that have really helped guide me as a writer um, that I think might be beneficial for you all to keep in mind. So the first principle is write. So even if it's only a single paragraph, even if it's only a single sentence, Perhaps more than anything, the most important thing for writing is just to be consistent. It can be really, really hard to get into a groove where you feel like you're writing. But the flip side is also true. If you're in that groove and you have a rhythm, the inertia tends to build on itself. So I highly recommend setting aside some time every day to write, even if it's just 10 minutes. If it's more, great but just something to kind of keep that muscle loose, to keep that part of your brain thinking, to keep you in a rhythm writing. So the second principle is read. The number one thing to do to be a better writer is to write more. The number two thing to do to be a better writer is to read more. So as you read and you come across things that you really like in a book or article, pay attention to what you liked about it. Was it the way the author wrote the sentence? Was there some element of surprise? Were they explaining something very rationally? And the flip side is also true. When you read things that you don't like, those can be really instructive too because it helps you realize what perhaps isn't good writing. So was it too complex? Was it too confusing? Were there way too many characters for you to keep track of? So as you read, not only are you gaining information about whatever you're reading, and if you're reading fiction, hopefully getting lost in a really good story, but you're also absorbing all of these ideas on what makes for good writing and what doesn't make for good writing. So the third principle is to follow your interests. So writing is really hard. And I think part of the reason that I probably did poorly in writing at school when I was your guys' age is because the topics that I was assigned to write about probably weren't things that interested me. In fourth and fifth grade, I was super into NBA basketball. I was into video games and I was into sneakers. No one ever assigned me to write about basketball, video games, or sneakers. My guess is that if people would have told me that I could write about that, I probably would have done a better job. So writing's really hard. Uh, it's hard to get started. It's hard to keep going. Um, it's hard to have the motivation to sit down and do it consistently. So it's really important that you write about things that interest you. Write about things that you're curious about. So even to this day, my guiding principle for anything that I write is I'm trying to figure out how to answer a question that I have. So I very rarely write something because I have it all figured out. I write about things because I'm interested in them and I want to figure it out. So my book, Peak Performance, I've always been fascinated by how do really elite top performers do what they do. So that led to a book. I didn't know the answer. I was really curious. So I decided I'd try to figure it out. My second book on passion, I was really curious at how come some people are really passionate for certain things and others aren't? And how come some people work so hard that they get burnt out and others are able to turn it off? That led to my second book. Um, so I've always let my interest and my curiosity drive my writing, not the other way around. I've never written about a topic because I thought other people would like to read about it. It's always been what interests me, and I think that makes the writing so much easier. So the fourth principle is to carry a notebook and pen with you wherever you are. You guys are more tech savvy. Maybe you guys have a digital device that can do it. I prefer a notebook and pen because if I try to take notes on my phone, what happens is I end up getting distracted and the next thing you know, I'm working in some other app or texting or down the rabbit hole of my phone. So everywhere I go, including right now, I carry one of these little notebooks and a pen. And that's because ideas almost never come to me when I'm trying to write. That'd be too easy. Ideas come to me when I'm out on a run or when I'm in the shower or when I'm playing with my son when I'm watching TV, when I'm reading a book. And I want to be on the lookout for the ideas. I want to be able to catch them when I have them because good ideas are hard to come by. So people ask me, when do you write? And what I tell them is I try to write for at least an hour a day 
but I'm also always writing because I'm always having these ideas. And when I have ideas, I jot them down in my notebook and then they're there for me when I do sit down to write. So I try never to let a good idea go to waste. Okay, this is a really important principle. And that is that first drafts suck and that's okay. Just get started. So something that was a big trap for me and sometimes still is, is when I sit down to write, I think that what I'm doing has to be really poetic right off the get-go. So A, sometimes that intimidates me to even get started, because I'm like, oh, I'm not in the mood to write well, maybe I just shouldn't write. Or B, I get so hung up on the first sentence of what I'm writing, that I never make it any farther, because I'm trying to edit as I go. So what I've learned is that when I write a first draft, the goal is just to write. It doesn't matter if I vomit on the page and it's totally crappy, as long as I get something down on the page. Because then this magical thing happens. I step away from what I did and I come back to it perhaps the next day or even later in that day. And when I come back to it with fresh eyes, suddenly the pieces start to fall into place and I can edit. So I've never written a good first draft in my life, never. If I were to share with you guys my first drafts, you'd probably say, how is this guy getting paid to write? And what I would answer is I'm getting paid to write because I have the courage to write a really crappy first draft, knowing that when I come back to edit it, I'll have the opportunity to make it better. So that leads me to my next principle, which is editing is everything. So I like to think of writing not is the genius striking and suddenly I'm writing the next Harry Potter in one sitting, but much more, I like to think of it kind of like I'm an auto mechanic. So my first draft is always broken and then my job is to fix it. And that requires chipping away at it. So I view writing itself as a very small part of the writing process. I'd say for any given thing I do, probably no more than 20% is actually spent on writing, probably less. The other, well, actually much less. Most, most of it is the research and reporting. But even once research and reporting is done, probably 20% is writing and the other 80% is editing. Because I've gotten really good at writing crappy first drafts, so they don't take me that long anymore. But then I come back and I edit. And two things here that are also really important is it can be very helpful to read your drafts out loud. And here's why. When you're writing something, everything sounds good in your head because it's your head. So it makes sense to you. But when you read it out loud, what you often catch is that it might not make sense to the reader because in your head, maybe you're inserting a comma or semicolon or an extra word where it's not on the page because that's just your brain being like, oh, well, this is what I meant, so I'm gonna read it like that. But when you read it out loud, it helps you catch errors that you might not otherwise have caught because it forces your brain to shift from the position of just being in your head to actually receiving what you're doing as if you were a writer. So I read everything that I do out loud to myself as I edit. And then the other important thing is just to shift that mindset where editing is not something that you do separate from writing, it's a key part of the writing process. So I never get frustrated when I'm editing my crappy first drafts. I actually get really happy. I'm like, great, the crappy first draft is done. Now I get to sit down and make it better. Okay, so a few other things that um, might seem surprising, but I do my best to explain why here. So exercise. I am not a professional athlete. Sometimes I wish that I was. I'm a professional writer, but I still view exercise as a key part of my job. So a couple things. There's all kinds of research that shows that physical activity and movement is associated with creative thinking. One study found that if you give people a break in between periods of their work and they sit during that break or they go on a walk, the people that go on a walk come back with 40% more creative ideas. Other research shows that if you use your body physically, you have a much easier time sitting down and focusing. 
So if I didn't exercise, I would never be able to stay focused for a period of writing. And I can tell you that probably 70% of my good ideas for writing came to me while I was exercising. Again, I have my notebook with me. So when I go on a run, notebook's in the pocket. If I'm going to strength train, notebook's with me. Um, so physical activity, we like to think of it as just something for our physical health, but it's also really important for our mental health and our creativity. Um, so it, it's become such an integral part of my job as a writer. And this is nice because I don't have to think of exercise as something I do instead of writing. I get to think of it as a part of my job. So I would encourage you guys as students to think of physical activity as part of being a really good student because it's going to make you more creative, help you focus better, um, and do all these things that are outside of just physical health. So the next principle is to try to eat well. So what you put into your body is the fuel that it runs on. And though we often think that our brains are different than our body, they're not. Our brains are an organ, a muscle, just like any other organ or muscle in our body. So if we're eating a lot of crap, it's hard to think really well. If we're eating well, it becomes much easier. Your brain literally just works better. And then the last principle is sleep. So there's this common misconception that you get smarter and you get more creative and you grow when you're in school or when you're working on something, when you're staring at the whiteboard, when you're trying to solve a problem. But what the research shows is that that's not really true. You actually get smarter and grow in your sleep. So everything that you do throughout the day, you're exposing your brain to all kinds of stimulus, things that you've heard, things that you've seen, people that you've bumped into, conversations that you've had, presentations like this. And it's only when you sleep that your brain goes through all that information, decides where it's gonna store it, decides how easy it's gonna be to retrieve, and connects it to other pieces of information in your brain. So I've come to think of sleep kind of like exercise. It doesn't seem like it's related to writing, but it's such an important part of my job because everything I expose myself to during the day, the value of it grows so much more when I sleep. So I'm gonna finish with just a couple slides. Um, you guys might notice that in the bottom corner of these slides, there's a little logo and something that says the growth equation. And the growth equation is a media platform that my co-author and I developed based on um, a mental model or a concept that really guides all of our work. So what is the growth equation? So the growth equation is this notion that stress plus rest equals growth. So when I use the word stress, I don't talk about stress as the kind of stress where you're really nervous before a pop quiz or you're anxious because you're gonna ask another person out on a date. I use stress in much more of a biological sense. So stress is some kind of stimulus, some kind of event that challenges you or makes you uncomfortable. So it's a just manageable challenge. It's something that's ever so slightly outside of your comfort zone. So if you think about on a scale of 10, if one out of 10 is you're bored and you're going through the motions, and 10 out of 10 is you're really anxious, the kind of stress that I'm talking about here is like a seven out of 10. So it's ever so slightly outside of your comfort zone. You think that you can do it, but you're just not sure. You're really pushing yourself. So then what's rest? Well, rest is stepping away. It's taking breaks. It's making sure that you sleep. It's spending time in nature. It's exercise. It's moving your body. It's playing. It's also reflecting. So after you take on one of these challenges, well, what went well? What did, I do? what did I do a good job with? What didn't go well? What can I tweak to improve in the future? So the equation is stress plus rest equals growth. So if you're not challenging yourself and all you're doing is kind of resting and kind of going along at a one out of 10, you're not gonna grow. But the flip side is also true. If all you're ever doing is challenging yourself and you never have time to rest or recover, 
you're gonna get injured or sick or burnt out. So the way to grow any muscle, whether it's your biceps muscle in your arm, or whether it's your skill as a writer, is to follow this cycle of stress, rest, and growth. So take on challenges, push yourself, make yourself a little bit uncomfortable, then make sure to step back so that you can rest, recover, and reflect, and then you get better. And then you just continuously do this cycle and you adjust as you go. It's very easy. You tend to know if you're stressing yourself way too much and not resting enough, you start to get burnt out. Whereas if you're not stressing yourself enough, you start to get bored. So in everything I do in my life, I really try to see, well, where am I at in this cycle and where should I be at? And that helps me to keep growing in a sustainable way. So those were my slides. Like I said at the beginning, I really wanted to save um, a fair amount of time for discussion and questions. So um, hopefully we can dive into that now. And you guys can feel free to ask me um, clearly on any of the slides, but also just any general questions um, that you might have. Yeah, Mac. What makes a good... Uh, sorry, Mac, you cut out there. Can you try one more time? What makes a good guider? What makes a good what? Writer. Oh, what makes a good writer? So I think that the number one thing I'd say is probably curiosity. So if you're really curious about things, that tends to help the writing process because writing doesn't feel as much like a chore. So if you want to figure something out, you can literally just go through the process of figuring it out, but instead of doing it in your head, you're doing it on the page. You're writing that process. So I tend to think the best nonfiction books anyways are from really curious people that want to figure something out. In terms of fiction storytelling, I think that if you like to live in your head and you're creating characters and you really like fantasy and you're constantly thinking of alternative universes and what would a better world look like and coming up with characters, those are really, really good qualities for fiction writing. And the same kind of thing, the, the work of writing is to get that stuff out of your head and get it onto the page. Um, so I think that just being curious, people often think that you have to be born creative. I don't really think that's true. I think that if, you, if you're curious about how things work in the world, Creative creativity is almost a byproduct of that. You become more creative as you go. I have a question. Yes. Um, and you already kind of touched on on this in your your pieces of uh, your tips for writing. But um, if you could go back and and tell your younger writing writing self a really key piece of information, what would you want to tell yourself? Hmm, that's a great question. How young? What, at what stage? I guess like my age we're at here, like between nine and 11. Yeah, so in grade school, what would I tell myself? I would tell myself to, and this is gonna sound cliche, but I guess some cliches are cliche for a reason. I would tell myself um, not to take things so seriously and to try to have more fun, including when I'm writing. Because what I find are the times that I have a light heart and I'm having fun while I'm working, time flies by and the end result tends to be the best work. Now, things aren't always gonna be fun because sometimes school is really freaking hard. So I'm not saying that everything should just be autopilot but the more of it I could bring a mindset of levity, holding things lightly and trying to have fun, that would have been really helpful. And then the second piece of advice I would have given myself is that you don't have to feel really motivated and good to get started. It's the opposite. You get started and then you feel motivated and good. So I was this kind of person that when I had homework, I would really try to like get myself psyched up to do the work. Whereas that's just wasted energy. What I've learned now is that you actually just have to start doing the work and the motivation will follow. Right. Um, so those would probably be the two, the two things I would tell myself. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, Milo. Um, 
Do you read your reviews? And if so, how do you deal with negative ones? <laughs> oh, man, this is a great question. So um, do I read my reviews? And if so, how do I deal with negative reviews? So I don't read all my reviews simply because um, there's just not enough time, especially in today's day and age where there's Amazon reviews and there's reviews on blogs and there's reviews on podcasts. Um, so you could spend your entire month reading reviews. I wish that I could say that I had the confidence to read none of my reviews, <laughs> but I don't. So I do read some of my reviews. Um, when I get a negative review, I, um, I feel bad <laughs> because I'm a human. Um, and that's okay. Like sometimes I get upset, sometimes I get mad, sometimes I get a little sad. Um, but what I really try to do when I do read reviews is to have an open mind. And there are two kinds of quote unquote negative reviews. One is an earnest when someone is pointing out things that I genuinely could have done better. So for instance, my second book, a lot of people said that the title, they didn't know what it meant. It didn't make sense. And at first I was kind of defensive about it because I helped come up with the title. I really liked it. But once I stopped being defensive and I started to explore what they're saying, I realized that they were actually right. Like what is the passion paradox? Peak performance, everyone knows what that means, right? If I said peak performance, you guys would have an idea of what that means. But if I say passion paradox, do you guys know what that means? No, it's a bad title. <laughs> so the negative reviews helped me realize that. But it was only once I had the humility to really accept them and read them with an open mind. And the other subcategory of negative reviews are what I call the haters. And haters are just people that are having a really rough day or have a bone to pick with you or don't like your political beliefs or God knows what. And they are just throwing junk your way in a very negative way, not really offering anything constructive. And over time, I've learned that if you take those reviews to heart, you're just going to be miserable. So I have no problem just completely dismissing those reviews and not really worrying about it. And then this is um, a parallel to your question. The reviews that I care most about are the reviews of the people that I respect most. So I really care what my wife has to think about my work because she's an avid reader and I love her. She's my wife. Um, we're all mutually connected here through Shane. When I send Shane a copy of my book, I think Shane's a really rigorous, smart thinker. So I care about his work and I care about what he says about mine because I know that he's kind of put in the work and he cares enough about me to have a review that is honest and full of integrity. Um, so if I were really great, what I would do is I would just send my work to 20 people around me that I know are not going to be scared to tell me where it could be better. But I also know care about me and are, are good thinkers themselves. And I wouldn't read anything else. That would be um, ideal. But I do read reviews and probably spend too much time reading them. <laughs> Did that answer your question? Yes. Yeah, the other thing I'll say, this is a topic that I really like to talk about, is the other problem with spending time reading reviews is that generally speaking, people go into things because they like it. So the reason I write is because I really like writing. The more time you spend reading reviews and thinking about how many books you sold and all that kind of external stuff, what your friends think, the less it becomes about your joy and your love for the work and the more it becomes about trying to please other people or have conventional success or sell books or get rich or whatever it is. And that can lead to a lot of anxiety because then you're kind of chasing these external things that are outside of your control. So the more that you can just focus on your craft, so in this case, writing, and really just worry about writing and let the external stuff, let the chips fall where they fall, um, the long term, the better that I think that you'll be. And that's not just of writing, that's true of just about anything. Okay. Anyone else have any other questions for Brad? Oh, I see a hand up somewhere. Oh. Will, what's up, man? 
Uh, I think you're on mute. I can't hear you, Will. Can anyone else hear Will? Will, maybe chat your question. Um, um, Will, Will, also, um, if you click the mic button on your bar where it says, like, sound and sound and the brightness on your computer, there's a mic button and then there's a camera. Click the mic. It should turn on. No, we still can't hear you. Will, do you know, give me a thumbs up. Do you know how to use the chat function and that way you can maybe chat your question in? Yeah, we all, we all know how to use the chat function. All right, he, just chat the question in. Um, he, he'll he's, saying like, he's saying his dad is Shane Parrish. <laughs> oh, your dad's Shane, Will? Yeah, yeah, Will and Mac are brothers. I can only chat to Julia. I can hear you now. What's up, man? It's because he's talking through my microphone. Got it. All right, I can... Don't worry about it, Will. I can hear you. You can just ask your question or say what you want to say. No, you went out again, man. No, Mac, keep your uh, mic on. Mac, keep your mic on. My dad's... Yeah. Yeah. Mac, Mac and Will are brothers. So Mac, Mac and Will's dad yeah. is Parrot. Or yeah. Shane Parrish. Will, we in can't what? hear you. In, I can... Mac, stop muting yourself. Mac, I think Mac, I think you're the problem, Mac. Mac, you gotta stay off mute. Say it again. I can only chat. He's saying he can only chat to Julia. We can only chat to Julia. Got it. So do you have a question, Will, or did you just want to share that your dad is Shane? Yeah. Do you have a question? No, he just wants to share that his dad Shane. Don't take your dad too seriously. <laughs> um Yeah. If you ask a Google Home what who Shane Parrish is, it's gonna um, say he's a fictional it, it character. It says he's a fictional don't, character. Don't take him too seriously. Uh, yeah, Shane, don't take him too seriously, guys. Well, uh, 